Hello and welcome. My name is Hugo Curry and I'm a Year 12 high school student at the Riverina Anglican College in Wagga Wagga, Australia. This is a series of brief interviews with some of the most amazing physicists from around the world. I'm passionate about physics and will pursue a career in physics and engineering, so I'm honoured to be able to ask a few questions of some inspirational physicists. I really want to thank them all for generously taking the time to chat and, importantly, to pass on their rich insights. Hopefully other students with an aptitude for physics can take inspiration and guidance from experience and insights to shape the next generation of physicists. Today we'll be talking to Professor Rand Klein. Professor Klein is an imaging physicist at the Ottawa Hospital and University of Ottawa. He is also a professor in engineering and physics at Carleton University in Canada. Klein has more than 100 journal publications for research in image quantitation and computer aided diagnosis. He has a degree in computer engineering, master's degree in electrical engineering, and a PhD in medical physics applications. Thanks, Rain, for taking the time to share your thoughts and experiences. It's a real pleasure. Thanks for having me. All good. Um, so firstly, what drew you to a career in physics and what excites you about physics? Yeah, so I, I never um, planned to get into physics per se. Um, but it is serendipitous. So um, when I was in high school, I got into this uh, really nerdy program. So, you know, I spent uh, four years of my life with a bunch of geeks and I, I did my high school in Israel. So in Israel, they have this credit system. I don't know the exact numbers, but I think it's typical for a student to finish with something like 20, 25 credits. Uh, we all did like 35, 40 credits. And when I reflect back, it was very little of it was work. It was mostly mostly fun. The extra courses we did were all electrical engineering, um, computer science, physics was uh, my favorite, by far my favorite. But uh, my perception of physics was was pretty skewed at the time. So I thought as physics as a as a pure science, you know, it's people in a lab. And that's not what I wanted to do. I'm, I'm an engineer, you know, I like to see problems. I like to solve problems. So um, long story short is that um, I wound up doing my undergrad in computer engineering. And during that time, we in Canada, we have, uh, that's where I did my undergrad. We have this uh, co-op program. So uh, we, every once in a while, every few semesters we go and we, we, we get a job essentially. And my first job, and I can still remember it completely vividly, I was sitting across from uh, Dr. DeCamp from the Heart Institute. And it was like, at the end of this half hour interview, we just looked at each other and it was like, okay, like clearly we hit it off. Like this is gonna go down. And so I did my first co-op with Rob and then I dropped out of the co-op program and I just kept working for him part-time throughout my undergrad. Um, so that, so Rob was at the Heart Institute working in the domain of PET imaging uh, for cardiac applications. Now, for those of you who don't know, um, PET is a nuclear medicine modality. Um, when I started in the early 2000s, it was relatively new modality, uh, still it's an in infancy. And um, we started this research that had to do with quantifying blood flow to the heart. So we had a long established practice of imaging the heart for blood flow, but you couldn't really quantify it. So you didn't know like how much flow was going to the heart. And that's what um, we started working on. And it's through that research that I just, I got pulled more and more into what is now physics. Um, but um, today in the disciplines, the, the lines are very, very blurry, right? So even though I'm an engineer um, by training, you know, my title says physicist and the distinction isn't really obvious. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what do you see on the horizon for physics or engineering that would inspire the next generation? Yeah, so um, physics I think has evolved a lot. Like we, we still do experiments but the experiments today are, they're big, you know, like Large Hadron Collider, Legos, um, you know, like NASA. 
that's that's where a lot of the breakthroughs in physics today are happening and as a result it's no longer a man in a lab like that that image of the scientist with the lab coat um it's it's not really like that anymore today the image is more of like a team of you know it can be a few people it can be thousands of people it can be a bunch of nations getting together um and so th- there's still there's still theory and there's still a lot of the things that you kind of think of when it comes to physics but really what's driving it a lot today is data da- data is is the key word right and as a result you see physicists um doing a lot of computer data science machine learning you know these hypes that you hear about in silicon valley and and all that like they're definitely um embedding themselves in physics as well um so that's kind of where where things are are going um but physics as a as a discipline it still has some really fundamental questions and key ideas and as a discipline it's still going to remain a pure science that is going to drive what's probably going to be our biggest innovations in the future yeah yeah i've noticed that as well um uh, looking at university degrees and whatnot in the last year a few years data science has really kind of come out of nowhere in australian universities as a as a degree or as more more of an option and so i think i've noticed that as well that um it's becoming more relevant i guess yeah it's a uh, I, i would really um push a lot of the next generation to uh start embracing the computer as a real tool and i mean i mean more than just like you know being familiar with facebook and clicking on web pages it's um speaking the computer's language is is very important because um just like english today is an essential language for doing um high impact science uh being able to speak to a computer i think is becoming just as important yeah yeah and it's a universal language too isn't it uh it is um you know the the basics of it definitely are they apply from one language to another but yeah. um you know it's a uh, for for somebody of my age and i'm like mid career not even that old um you know there are new languages and it's kind of like daunting you know it's like ah oh, do i learn python now or yeah. um you know is it is it worth the effort <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah exactly but yeah the concepts do apply and it's i really encourage anyone almost in any discipline you know like you know at least get familiar with the concepts uh of, yeah. of how a computer works under the hood yeah um So what skills have you relied on most throughout your career? Um you got to be adaptable, you got to learn. Um you, you know, we we're just I just finished a defense uh reviewing somebody's defense today, you know. And um they 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 mentioned something about looking forward to a break from learning and it's like whoa 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 like you know you're so far away from being done learning like i'm still learning you know w- w- which is kind of nice you know like i i laugh that i get paid a pretty handsome salary to be a student you know whereas most students they pay money to be to be a student so learning is really important um the other one is that as you become um more advanced in your career a lot of us move on to become managers and so the interpersonal skills that's that's really essential you know it's um when when we i i spoke about you know the typical nerd right which is where i came from and you know amongst us we get along really well but you know when we leave our bubble we're kind of uncomfortable and but but you have to realize that that's that's a real limitation because there's going to come come a point where you won't have a choice you have to interact with other people you have to um manipulate them in quotes to get on board with your ideas and your direction and so those interpersonal skills they're really worth uh fostering um you know it's no matter how geeky you are you can only sit in front of a computer for so long and eventually you have to talk to real people the other one that is um i find people with my background underestimate is communication skills so 
in science, you know, everybody talks about the research and the exciting findings and so on. But the only way we find out about these exciting findings is because they're communicated outward of the lab, right? And so, you know, the, the, the English teacher that you're kind of like, yeah, well, it's English, you know, it's not really that important. Um, you know, at this point in my life, I know to reflect back and say, that's, that's not the case, you know, like you need to be able to not only speak like we are now, but your, ver your, your written communication also has to be very good. Um, and admittedly, I think that the young, your generation is somewhat disadvantaged because your habits are to communicate in short spurts through text and Facebook and, you know, what, what, whatever new up and coming platform is coming, but to really sit down and write like an essay, um, from beginning to end, uh, you know, sells an idea, develops the idea. Um, that's that's really essential, um, and uh, and I really encourage um, everyone to develop those skills. Otherwise, you you don't you don't get listened to. I mean, not not by the masses. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you've had such an amazing career. Um, I'm interested to know what's been the highlight for you. Yeah. So. Um, I'll answer that in two in two ways, right? Because people often look at the highlight as kind of like like the pinnacle, you know, the success that gets celebrated and, and, and all that. And I mean, that's that's easy. Like we all want to succeed, right? Uh, but there's a journey to get there, and I, I think very often um, we're not good at celebrating the journey, right? The challenges uh, that come along the way. Um, the, the period that I probably look back on with the most fondness was probably my master's career. Um, I spent a year, year and a half in a, a dungeon of a lab. And um, I was working really, really, really by myself. You know, like literally like if I would have keeled over and died in the lab, like nobody would have found me until the next day. <laughs> um, and but I loved what I did. I, I really like, you know, I wasn't getting paid uh, very little, you know, like enough to cover rent, but not much more than that. I was working like easily 14, 16 hours days. I'd come in on the weekend of my own accord. I, I really loved what I did. Um, it was a project that, you know, my supervisor just had to kind of mention the idea to me. And I was like, all in, you know, like no questions asked. I'm going to get this done. Um, that project ended up to be really successful. So I think it's really defined my career, but I don't want you to misunderstand that it's because of the success that I see as the highlight. That's not it. It's, I really found something that I really, really, really wanted to do. And in hindsight, you know, it's not like even I was so good at it, you know, I was okay, but I wasn't like, I didn't come into it knowing exactly what had to be done but it was just fun. It was just fun. So I learned everything I had to learn. So, you know, to get a little bit more specific, um, pretty much what was described to me was that um, we want you to develop this rubidium elution system. So um, in cardiac imaging, there's this tracer called rubidium 82. Um, it gets magically generated in a generator. So through radioactive decay, we load it with strontium 82 and strontium 82 uh, decays into rubidium 82. And so um, rubidium 82 has a very short half-life. Uh, it's only 76 seconds. So, you know, if you kind of like eluded it off the generator and, you know, put it in a vial and measured it and then inject it to the patient, in the time you would do that, you'd lose most of your activity, right? And with the activity is the signal that we measure. So we need the activity there. So I was asked to build a device that would inject this aluet directly into the patient so it was already a medical device like you know it was already like what like i'm gonna control a system that's going to like be electronic it's gonna have an iv that connects to the patient and i'm gonna have a computer system that monitors this thing and controls it and so you know that was kind of cool in itself but then it had kind of everything that i like so 
I was not one of those people that in high school was like, hey, this is what I want to be when I grow up. I kind of like everything. That's my problem. And so it had electrical engineering. I had to build circuits. It had computer programming. It had mechanical engineering. I was down there with a jigsaw, you know, with like shrapnel of steel metal flying all over the lab. Loved it. (laughs) And then, you know, and then, of course, the success did come with that, like I said. So um, by the time I was finishing up my master's, um, we had it certified from an electrical safety point of view. We started using it in the clinic. So we had like real patients um, being hooked up to this thing. I was in the clinic, right? So it's like, I'd be right there and they'd be like, Ron, your machine crashed. And I'd go in there and I'd patch the code and I'd like, okay, next patient, (laughs) good enough. Um, And then of course we patented it. We commercialized it through an industry partner. Um, I got to be like a consultant for that business partner, right? Which is a really nice feeling too, that you kind of get brought in only when you're needed as like the expert to solve the problems that nobody else can figure out. It's a great feeling. Yeah. Um, and then that project just had long, longevity that, that defined my career for another 10 years after that. Nice. Yeah. I like that perspective of uh, the highlight of the career. Um, and even in like a niche setting such as my school, say a student gets like an exemplary mark, um, at, the, at their final HSC, like their final um, mark for all of school. Um, people celebrate the mark, but they don't celebrate the relationships with the teachers. They don't celebrate the hard work and the, the skills, like the learning skills that they've built. So the different ways they've learned to learn and what they've learned about themselves learning. And so I think um, I really like that perspective about um, finding the highlight. It's not just the end result. It's how you got there and what you enjoyed along the way. So, so I'd like to reflect on that a little bit, uh, Hugo. One of the things I, I thought, you know, when, when I was a student was like, well, eventually you're going to go to the real world and your employer is going to want you to do a job, right? And it's like, they don't care about your hardships. They just want a product, right? And that may be true in some places. I can't, I can't say my experience isn't infinite. But what I'm finding more and more in academia, in healthcare, that's not really true, actually. People do actually um, care about your hardships as well, right? Like, so when when I apply for a research grant, you know, like there's a section in there where I talk about um, setbacks in my career, right? I had a child, you know, that's a setback in my career versus somebody who didn't have a child. And, you know, if I'm the mother and I'm supposed to nurse that child and take care of that child, well, that should be recognized, right? That that additional hardship. Um, if I'm taking care of an ailing parent, right? Like, and and I think that that is that is important. I'm not the only one that says this. I, the the as a society, I think we do see that um, people succeed, and their success has to be measured not only um, based on on the final product, but also what they had to be up against. Yeah. And so, you know, I would, I would tell, I, I myself am dyslexic, you know, it's, it's hard for me to read. Um, I have terrible writing. Like I read, I remember studying for my comprehensive exams and having to go through my notes from my undergrad. And I think that's when I discovered I was dyslexic. I mean, the, <laughs> the, the, the writing mistakes uh, were unbelievable, but, um, but it, it, you know, you overcome and, and, you shouldn't you shouldn't brush the things under the table you should you should take credit for it it's uh i I'm, you should get credit for it that despite those hardships you still manage to do something meaningful with your life yeah yeah i totally agree yeah um so is there anything in physics that is important or contentious that you would like to see the next generation of physicists work on yeah, so I'm, I'm not a pure physicist, right? So I don't know everything that's happening. Um, you know, the, the topics that to me look really exciting and are going to influence society potentially in the next decade, two decades, right? So within our lifetime, um, I think quantum computing is, is really exciting. You know, like the potentials there are 
tremendous because there are so many problems that um, are really hard for us to do with traditional computing, right? So uh, I don't know if you know this, right? But like there are server farms today that require as much energy as a city, as a small city, right? And so when you imagine like people, you know, mining for Bitcoin as, as a popular example, right? And then that mining is powered by burning of coal. You're kind of like, ah, we're like wrecking the planet for what? Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, quantum computer, okay, fundamentally changes the way we solve problems yeah. and can have really dramatic um, implications for, for society. Of course, like with every science, it depends what we do with it. Some of it can be for the good and some of it can be for the bad. But I mean, that's, that, that's for us to decide. Um, the other one that I find really um, interesting is entanglement, part of it called entanglement and the prospects that it can do for long distance communications, secure communication, um, even things like um, uh, remote elections, you know, where it's like when you cast your vote, only one person can read that vote. And if anybody interferes along the way, pff, the message yeah. gets destroyed, right? That's that's pretty cool stuff. So yeah. um, encryption and communication, I think, I think that's really neat. And um, I've never heard anybody talk about it, but in, in, in the domain of pet imaging, which I work in, we our business is to detect pairs of photons that are created simultaneously. And by definition, they're entangled, right? And so it's actually, it will be really interesting to see as the technology develops, if there is a way to actually um, measure that entanglement, you know, know that two photons are entangled, which could actually result in higher quality medical images than are presently capable uh, possible. Yeah, yeah, that is cool, yeah. That's really the, the amazing thing about physics or science as a whole is that you have these concepts that, you know, they're, they, they, they start off as like theoretical thought games maybe, but, you know, once they become reality, the implication of society can be um, really, really provocative, you know, and that's, I think the example that's very commonly given is lasers, right? Like, in the 1920s, the concept of lasers was like a toy. But can you imagine society today without lasers? Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. No, that is very interesting. I, um, for a maths assignment uh, that I did oh, a couple months ago now, I was looking at, um, so there's, they used artificial intelligence in the diagnosis um, of, like when they're interpreting the scans from um, nuke med scans. That's and right. so I was looking at a mathematical, uh, the Fourier transform, which is like an old mathematical thing that's used in um, signal processing and that, um, that sort of thing. And I was looking at it, we used, we coded it up and it into artificial intelligence. And instead of having like a big convolutional neural network, it was just um, Fourier series straight into a neural network. And I think um, it was something like five times faster um, to process the images and produce the same, the results with the same accuracy. And then it's um, a lot easier for uh, filtering the images so it can make it clearer and then identify specific regions. So I just thought that was really awesome. Like I really enjoyed it um, looking at the applications of it and then piecing things together that, that's that's really neat and you know like I, I don't know that that's much talked about in the scientific literature you know you might you might be onto something that's uh <laughs> that's that's really interesting um and your, your teachers did a really good job there right so um right now like ai machine learning it's it's a huge a huge hype like everybody and their sister are getting together and throwing their data at AI and, and, and they're hoping for magic and unicorns to come out at the other end. Um, but it doesn't really work that way, you know? So like we're, we're building on like centuries of good science, good mathematical models that really give us insight. 
And, you know, the Fourier transform is, is a fantastic example, actually. And, you know, I've seen that in action. So I, I was in this class, I was auditing this class at the university and the prof gave, uh, broke everybody up into teams. There were like 40 teams and they were given a data set and they had to classify the data set into different groups. And, you know, everybody took the data and, you know, threw it into the blender and got varying degrees of, of uh, results. And one team, you know, they, they were funny. They were kind of cocky about it. They're like, we got 100% accuracy. It's like, what do you mean? Like a hundred percent, like we can classify everything exactly. It's like, how did you do it? Well, we did a Fourier transform and then we did the machine learning, right? They were the only ones that thought of that. And it's, and that's exactly right because the mathematical models that we use, they're a subset of models, okay? Like we in life, in, in everyday life, you use models all the time. And these models are a way to understand the world around us. Yeah. And so um, that's why we learn. That's why we build on uh, the success of scientists before us, right? Because these models, um, we understand how they work. They're predictable. They're powerful. And I, my fear is that we're going to go through like 20 years where we're going to not emphasize these models as much as we should. I'm even afraid that some of them will get kind of forgotten because we're going to rely on the computer and AI to, to do their magic. And um, I feel that we're actually going to kind of lapse and there will be kind of like a resurrection 20 years down the road where all of a sudden everybody's going to be like, hey, there's a model here by this guy for you. And it's like really useful. It makes things work so much better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that definitely is... Um... The possibility for AI, especially since you don't know what's really going on in the AI, you just put it in and get the result. I think there's just a lot of unknowns that can be forgotten in the process, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And so that's, that's kind of the field of my current research is, is more exactly along what, what you're talking about. And, you know, whereas I would say five years ago, um, you know, radiologists would be like shaking in their boots that like AI is going to take over their jobs and they're going to be unemployed. Uh, today, we understand that it's, it's far from that. Yeah, AI is going to trickle in. It's going to augment us. It's going to help us um, with very specific tasks. Um, but we're a far cry away from having like what's called generalized intelligence, you know, like a machine that can really rationalize um, it can be applied to a vast range of problems. They're, they're, they're very specific right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, last question that I've got on the sheet here. Do you have any pearls or pitfalls to offer high school students that have an aptitude to physics? Yeah, um, this is a good start, you know, like really try to seek out what, what physics physicists do what they what they can do where they can contribute okay because um the stereotype of the physicist is quite inaccurate from my experience um and there can be a lot of very very exciting careers um you know a lot of physicists actually that that graduate today they go to work for financial firms you know modeling stock markets you don't think of that as a physicist. Um, but on the other hand, um, you know, take a chill pill. You know, you, people that are, you know, finishing high school, high school, they're still young. It's okay to not know what you want to do. It really is. Um, it's good to know what you like doing. It's good to know what you think you're passionate about and to pursue that and kind of brace yourself up for a long journey ahead and make that journey enjoyable okay so it's you know it's it's like a road trip you know nobody gets into the car to do a road trip thinking only about where they're going to be 15 hours from now no like you enjoy the process of of getting there and so you know I always looked at my career as like kind of stepping into a field you know I never really saw that mountain in the distance that I knew I was going to walk towards that mountain. I always looked a few steps ahead 
And I kind of stepped in the direction where it looked like, well, maybe there is not a bog here. Maybe this is a, a smooth trail, you know, but, you know, I, I also stayed true to what I liked, right? So I had a short career in um, telecommunications. And while I did some great stuff and I have some great stories to tell about that, ultimately I felt that, you know, being able to move some bits of data from one end of the world to the other just wasn't enough for me, you know, like yeah. we had a good handle on that, you know, we're con- going to continue to have a good handle on that. I wanted to do something that was a bit, a bit more challenging, a bit different. And so every time you say yes to something, everything, every time you take something on, you're actually saying no to a lot of other possibilities. And so I really encourage people to, you know, slow down, not rush, you know, like money comes, money goes, uh, but you only live once, right? And so, you know, it's okay to take a bit of time and seek out an option that really makes you go like, wow, th- th- this is cool. I really want to do this. Yeah. And then, and then you're laughing. And then you're laughing. Then you're never working. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah, that's good. It sounds like you've, um, the, at least the, the part you're in now is, is like that for you of your career that you, you're, um, enjoying it. So. That's what for, for I can aim for. for. For the most part, for the most part. I mean, you, you know, you, you get torn a million different ways. You know, I don't love every, every task that I do every day. And that's okay. You know, that's why they call it work. And, and that's why we get compensated for our time. Um, but, but so you, you should have some tolerance for things that maybe you don't enjoy doing, but you have to do, right? Not, you can't party all the time. But, uh, but overall, the big picture is that, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, try to surround yourself with like-minded people. You know, if you're in the, the only one in the room, you know, that doesn't like, you know, being in front of a computer for eight hours a day, that means something, you know, like don't, you're not going to grow to love it, you know, like take that into account. So, you know, maybe maybe you don't want to be the kind of physicist that sits in front of a, of a computer all day. Maybe you want to be um, the kind of physicist that is in the lab, you know, doing experiments, playing with equipment. Um, maybe you want to do something that's more in the field and physics is, is everywhere, you know, like I've, I've interacted with physicists that, you know, work in geology. So they're climbing around volcanoes and sticking electrodes in the side of electro of uh, volcanoes, you know, yeah. that's, that's, I appreciate that. I respect that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and you, you know, like, and, and it's not to all careers, you know, like they're, they're legitimate, you know, there's something to be proud of. Um, I tell a lot of people, you know, like academia isn't for everyone, you know, like we're in an age now where everybody goes to university and that's a path. It's a path forward it's not the only path, you know, if like, if you don't think that's for you, you know, find something else, but, but, you know, like, but do something with your time, make your life on earth be meaningful. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh, thank you uh, for such a rich insight into the world of medical physics. I really appreciate you taking the time to inspire the next generation of physicists and engineers. And I'm sure that those that listen will share my appreciation. It's been great chatting to you today. Gladly. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It's, uh, it, it's, it's really fun to be able to um, talk to a younger generation and, you know, hopefully, hopefully inspire. Um, but um, you have my contact information. I'm always happy to, to speak to younger people, you know, help them um, see what's out there, what, what, what the possibilities are. Uh, we didn't speak much about like specifics of medical physics and what I do in the day to day. That's fine. Um, but, you know, if somebody is, is keen and interested, I'm, I'm always happy to speak to people. Yeah, cool. Thanks for that. Yeah. No, it's been good. Um, catching up uh, two years ago in the, at the conference in Los Angeles, I think. That's when we met. And then it's catching up again now, which is good. Yeah. Yeah. So it's... Um, your dad really affords you unique opportunities, you know, to, to be able to 
to come and see and, and get get a feel for how things are um, yeah. you know we, we do do conferences it's not it's not the only thing we do it's it's, it's part of our lives um, but you know I, I think many academics such as as myself we're, we're usually very happy to show people you know the facilities we work in harder now with COVID you know and and, and all that but um, I think anybody who's like, well, I think a career in medical physics might be for me, you know, like, um, I, I really encourage you to just kind of do a Google search, see who's, who's in your neck of the woods, and just drop them an email, pick up the phone. Um, I think you'll be really surprised as to how many people are willing to you know throw the door wide open and and let people in and show them their multi-million dollar toys <laughs> yeah yeah definitely yeah i mean we're 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 quite distant from each other but if you were in ottawa <laughs> you, you say when and i'll i'll give you a tour that's yeah, crazy thanks <laughs>